If you live in the West, you probably think it's all going to hell in a handcuff. Give me a second, because things are happening very quickly. Kabul's airport. The city is in its sixth lockdown. For reasons we'll discuss in this video, you may be right. Not necessarily for the reasons you think. We're facing something we've seen before and we solved, but it's not looking hopeful right now because we're not talking seriously about the root cause of our problems. Let's have a look. Some of the big debates we have seem like they're points of principle, but really they're examples of status quo bias. So take the issue of healthcare. Regardless of whether single payer systems could provide better healthcare at significantly lower cost, Many Americans, particularly conservatives, will say they don't want socialism. Tell Britons, run by conservatives by the way, that the NHS is fat and bloated and inefficient and could be making better use of the private sector and everyone screams you're trying to sell it off. And tell the French that if life expectancy goes up then the pension age should go with it. If the country's going to avoid going bust, they will man the barricades. All these reactions are predominantly resistance to change. Their emotional responses, not rational evaluations of pros and cons. And the unspoken question underpinning the dilemma is this one. What actually is the state for? We know we have a troubled relationship with it. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. In this video, we're going to look at how we got here how the West's model of government triumphed, why it's now in decline and has been for some time, how alternative models are shining a light on the problem and we try to answer the question, is it too late to do something about it? It starts with the nation state, something we now take for granted as the primary way that we organise ourselves, but the nation state as a concept it's a relative latecomer. Territories have for many centuries been ruled by force. Hereditary monarchs are supreme rulers over their subjects. Empires forged in conquest being the standard way of governance. From the Roman Empire to the Mongol Empire, the Ottoman Empire. The natural state of humanity was competition. Violence, the rule of the strong. Justice often based on privilege rather than as of right. The philosopher Thomas Hobbes knew that better than most, he fled to Paris in 1640 to escape the coming English Civil War. Hobbes wrote the book that epitomised the change to come, Leviathan. And just to underline the point, when it was published in 1651, he then had to flee from Paris back to England to escape the royalists who hated Leviathan's subversive message. He posited that we need a powerful state to protect us from trying to kill and rob each other, which is what happens in the state of nature. That involves surrendering freedoms to Leviathan, the state who keeps law and order. Various liberal thinkers followed Hobbes, John Locke, then Adam Smith and David Hume, all of whom were focused in various ways on how you should limit the state's power. Locke pushed the notion of the social contract, that we gain civil rights in return for giving up some freedoms in the name of respecting and defending the rights of others. Thomas Paine put into words the most state sceptical sentiments that are found alive and well today. Society is produced by our wants and government by our wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections, the latter negatively by restraining our vices. The founding fathers in the US drew heavily on Locke's social contract, but in those early decades it was small and distant to the centres of world power, so its early influence was relatively limited. The French Revolution drew heavily on Rousseau's version of the same principle, but then that collapsed into the terror. So the next revolution in government fell to what was then the world's greatest power, Britain. After the conquest of Napoleon in 1815, there were two stories you could tell about Britain. One was that it was the world's dominant superpower. It ruled the waves with its powerful navy. It was the centre of the global economy, the ruler of an empire that spanned the world, and all of that was true. The other story was that it was fat and bloated, inefficient, running on privilege and corruption mostly a disenfranchised population, ripe for reform in other words, and that was also true. 
Into that status quo came William Gladstone and John Stuart Mill, who became the political and intellectual giants who shaped liberalism. Mill wanted to push back all constraints on freedoms. His position became associated with the idea of the minimal night watchman state. The state could only interfere in your life to stop you from doing harm to someone else. He believed that society would be richer and fairer if there was a complete economic and intellectual freedom and all opinions could be constantly tested and attacked with only the strongest enduring. Gladstone was the Prime Minister who took this and applied massive reforming energy to the task. He was a passionate defender of the poor, an advocate of equal opportunities, but he was also a major advocate for smaller government. He believed that the poor had a duty to help themselves out of poverty. He wanted health care to be provided by charitable hospitals. He scrutinised government spending minutely and accounted for it publicly, which was not the way such things had been done in the past. Nothing should be done by the state, which can be better done or as well done by voluntary effort, he said. This was the great reform that was needed at the time. Mill and Gladstone modernised and slimmed down the flabby and corrupt nation-state, literally enacting principles that today's politicians often pay lip service to, but never actually deliver. Efficiency, honesty, good governance. So two out of the three components on the modern state were present. There was just one more to come. Because as the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, people were noticing and focusing on some of the savage deprivation and the inequalities that were being thrown into sharp relief. In a world of poverty, nobody much notices poverty. It's just normal. But that wasn't the world anymore. So John Stuart Mill, the champion of individual liberty, started to ask himself, what's the point of all that liberty if you have no education? If you're forced to work in grindingly dangerous and demeaning labour just in order to barely survive. Novelists like Charles Dickens and Elizabeth Gaskell were highlighting the brutal unfairness of it all. Then in 1871, Bismarck united Germany and shaped the country on the belief that the government had to promote the general good over the self-serving businessmen. Good schools and a pension system became a distinctive feature of all of this And by 1900, Germany's example was taunting Britain. Beatrice Webb, along with her husband Sidney, became the intellectual forces that argued for the next step. In a dissenting minority report to a royal commission on the poor laws, on which she was a member, she described the outlines of a welfare state being one that would secure a national minimum of civilised life open to all alike, of both sexes and all classes, by which we meant sufficient nourishment and training when young, a living wage when able-bodied, treatment when sick, and modest but secure livelihood when disabled or aged. William Beveridge worked as a researcher for Webb on that report and ultimately was the one to introduce the welfare state to Britain in the 1942 Beveridge Report. Webb wasn't advocating free money for nothing. She was still a child of her time, so for instance she wrote this. What has to be aimed at is not this or that improvement in material circumstances or physical comfort, but an improvement in personal character. She believed that citizens who were given benefits by the community ought to make an effort to improve themselves, or at least submit themselves to those who would improve them. A reminder that through history... Ideas that started one way often morphed into something completely different over time. And there you had it, the three layers of good government that arguably fuelled the West's success. The nation state, the liberal state and the welfare state. It took Hobbes' notion that the state should protect its citizens from itself and significantly expanded it. Security didn't just mean stopping someone from killing you, although hopefully it still means that as well. The communists and the fascists showed what happened then if the state became too powerful. Whether the foundation of the state was class for the communists or race for the fascists, the result was the same nightmare. But most of the West did not go there. It layered the welfare state over the top of democracy and liberty, the function of government being to provide an enforced minimum for a civilised life. And that has stayed broadly the case. 
whether governing parties have been of the right, the centre or the left. Just that step by step, decade by decade, that enforced minimum has been ratcheted up a little more and a little more. What gets introduced as a privilege quickly becomes viewed as an entitlement. Free secondary education, unemployment pay and in Europe at least free health care. The Wall Street crash was proof, according to many, that the government couldn't trust capitalists to regulate themselves. And Roosevelt came in with a big spending New Deal to demonstrate that government spending was the answer. Over the coming decades, bureaucracies mushroomed. It was noted, for instance, that the smaller Britain's empire became, the bigger its colonial office became. The West became dominant for an extended period. Good governance was arguably the best advantage anyone had had. But the emergence of that model came from a history of initial invention, followed by repeated cycles of decline and then reform. And for a time now, we've clearly been in a period of decline. By the 1970s, Britain, the country of Gladstone, had a state that was absorbing almost half of the country's national income. Nearly a third of the workforce was employed by it, and it was often paralysed by strikes, derided as the sick man of Europe. But then, to be fair, nobody was doing brilliantly at that point. This was the era of stagflation, high inflation, low economic growth, high unemployment. For America, the Vietnam War ended in abject humiliation. Richard Nixon speculated that the US had become subject to the decadence that eventually destroys a civilization, before going on to kind of personally prove the point. And some people fought back against the growth of the state. Barry Goldwater stood for president, promising to reduce the size of the state. They didn't vote for him. They did vote for Reagan and Thatcher who set about the task. Thatcher described herself as part of a worldwide revolt against big government, excessive taxation and bureaucracy. The free market was in ascendancy. Thatcher did more than Reagan managed in reforming government, probably because Britain was in a worse shape overall and had more effective governance structures. She held her nerve, even as reforms led to massive unemployment and poverty, The results did then eventually begin to show. So, for instance, the number of employee days lost to strikes fell from nearly 30 million in 1979 to 2 million in 1986. 46 companies were taken out of state ownership by privatisation. State-run council houses were sold to their occupants and so on. And after all that, she did succeed in reducing government social spending from 22.9% of GDP in 1979 to... uh, 22.2% in 1990, 0.7 of a percent. Better than Reagan, mind. With the usual gridlock system in play in the US, Reagan financed his tax cuts from borrowing. Britain and America limited the number of civil servants they employed directly, but that just led to a huge growth in the number of contractors, creating an invisible shadow state. And the growth of the state was accompanied by the growth of regulations and complexity. According to historian Neil Ferguson, the Federal Register has grown two and a half times faster than the economy. Between 2000 and 2010, it grew by £73,000 a year. For reference, FDR's huge welfare legislation in the 1930s was just 30 pages long. Whenever something goes wrong, new regulations get added. Someone then has to be employed to process them. And then you end up with labels on packets of nuts saying may contain nuts and the US tax code having 42 different definitions of a small business. Did you know that to open a restaurant in New York, you need to deal with 11 different city agencies? And then you can look at recent Brexit barriers to importing into Europe where shipments get rejected if the voluminous paperwork has been filled in with the wrong colour pen ink. During the Great Depression, it took four years to build the Golden Gate Bridge. Today, it can take a decade just to clear the bureaucracy. When the New York Port Authority upgraded the Bayonne Bridge so it had more clearance for super tankers, it had to get 47 approvals from 19 government departments. The Reagan Thatcher revolution that did change the world, globalisation, started to lose its shine. It was still making a big difference in the developing world, helping to bring a billion people out of absolute poverty, halving it, even as the world population doubled, which is a miracle. 
But otherwise, freedom of movement began to create a backlash as the makeup of communities changed rapidly, jobs relocated to low-cost countries and low-wage workers came in to push wages down for the jobs that remained. And that's all before you get to the fact that the growing size and complexity of government makes capture by interest groups easy and relatively invisible. All those hundreds of pages of legislation are filled with special cases and exemptions and obscure funding projects, all feeding someone an extra slice of something. Even in a crisis, it doesn't get better. In Covid-struck Britain, PPE equipment was needed immediately, but it was ordered to be shipped rather than flown because the rules specified that flying stuff was not considered value for money. Even in that situation, following the rules was the default bureaucratic position when intuitively it was obvious that that process was going to cost lives. So all this, bloated, slow, bureaucratic state, strangled growth and freedoms, more and more complexity feeding into more problems, this is predominantly what fed the growth of the new populist movements, Trump, Brexit, Bolsonaro. They gained support by contrasting themselves with this dysfunctional state. What they didn't bring was real insight into an alternative system that works. All they could really do was to expose the dysfunctionality. And what they started, of course, COVID-19 completed. Western government has been in decline for ages. Trump didn't cause it, COVID didn't cause it, but they certainly put a focus on it. Meanwhile, a new model has been appearing in full sight, attracting envious and admiring glances, held by many to be the way forward. Before we get to that, if you made it this far and you're not subscribed to this channel, just hit that red button so you get to see more content like this when it appears. If you're a regular viewer and subscriber, thank you. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up to feed the YouTube algorithm gods and get this video shown to more people. Thank you all. Back to that shining example of a new approach. The tiny island state of Singapore, taken and shaped by Lee Kuan Yew. Lee was a smart guy, he won a scholarship to Cambridge, graduated with a double-starred first in law. After masterminding Singapore's independence, he re-engineered the state dramatically. Lee Singapore requires people to provide for their own long-term welfare through a system of self-insurance. They pay a fifth of their salaries into a central fund, with the state adding another 17%. This was to pay for their housing, pensions, healthcare and for their children's university education. The care of the old and the infirm was the duty of the family, supplemented by the state. People had to pay a small fee to visit doctors, just enough to discourage the overuse that's associated with free-to-use systems such as Britain's NHS. The education system is unapologetically focused on quality. It pays good teachers well, but you can't get a job in teaching unless you graduated in the top third of your class. The government will pay for your university education if you agree to teach for around five years after graduating. If you turn out to be a bad teacher, you get sacked. No messing about. Also, Lee emphasised attracting some of the brightest talents into the public sector creating a modern cohort of mandarins well-trained in the sciences. And his model produced striking results. In the top five for life expectancy in the world, bottom ten for infant mortality rates, schools that routinely finish top of the league tables in results while not being as costly. A state that has consistently been rated as the least corrupt country in Asia and in the top rank worldwide. And as I said, lots of envious eyes have been looking at the efficiency, the common sense, the excellent results. But it has an authoritarian flavour to it. Lee's party has effectively been a one-party state. Opposition politicians have often been bankrupted and disqualified from running for office. Critical journalists find themselves quickly unemployable. Do you need that hard edge to achieve the benefits? There's nothing inherent to the approach and the priorities that would make you think so. But you do need your democracy, of course, to be willing and capable of reform, because some big things would have to change. Now, the Asian tiger countries have been strongly influenced by Singapore. China, another level of authoritarian, of course. 
and with many complicating factors, but it's still following some of the key elements of the basic success formula, focusing on recruiting highly trained administrators and demanding high performance from them. They probably go too far and spoil the effect with a target setting regime that is as likely to produce perverse incentives. And that may be harder to avoid when you're the scale of China rather than the scale of Singapore. But it's rapidly building a healthcare system. It's focused on becoming an educational giant. It demands high standards of its students, actively bans the things that it believes to be corrupting the young people of the West. Computer games banned from playing for more than three hours per week. Ambiguous gender roles banned from any media that could define role models. Education focused on sciences and hard subjects, plus of course a bit of Communist Party propaganda thrown in. No critical race theory, no gender unicorns. The big question is whether China gets to enjoy its century of influence, as did the West before it. It would take another video to go into the detail, but the China experiment has challenges ahead. In the Gladstone slash Mill model, it's approaching a moment where it maybe needs reform to continue to grow. Whether it's capable of the right reform is an open question. And it's rather the same question that we ourselves face. If we can absorb the lessons of Singapore while holding fast to our democratic ideals, it's going to take a moment as big as anything we've pulled off before. In his book, The Wake Up Call, which inspired this video, John Micklethwaite says this, One reason why the state seems so ancient is that it does not learn. In the private sector, you have no choice. If a competitor anywhere in the world comes up with a better product or service, you respond or you go out of business. It is the devil's work to get British educational bureaucrats to learn from schools in Singapore or Finland. In higher education, German and French universities have watched talent and students seep away to the Anglo-Saxon world for decades without changing their habits. One of the most disappointing things about the EU is that it concentrates on regulating its member states rather than helping them to learn from each other. So if we're at a point where Gladstonian level reform is needed, what would that look like? Dominic Cummings, the Brexit mastermind and former chief advisor to Boris Johnson, recently published his own thoughts about the US on his blog. He said, first you need a government that controls the government rather than the bureaucracy controlling it as it has been for so long. He argued that you needed to close a number of departments and agencies and then create new lean startups to replace them, if they actually need replacing at all. These could be operated on completely different principles, staffed by completely different sorts of people. Who could do this? Not Democrats, not Trump. The Democratic Party is firmly in the grip of a generation of activists deranged by Ivy League insanity, BLM, etc. It will not be able to focus usefully on the serious issues until that mad energy has burned itself out. Whether Trump wins or loses, his candidacy will be terrible for everybody. He demonstrated no interest in actually controlling the government. He didn't drain even a corner of the swamp. He just annoyed it. You need someone, he argues, with a sort of creative approach of a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Cummings wrote this, High performance execution in complex operations requires a constant process of simplification, of stripping out unnecessary slash foolish requirements and processes, of stopping things to simplify and focus efforts on priorities. Look at Steve Jobs' relentless efforts. Look at how Elon Musk runs SpaceX and Tesla. Second, turning around failing organisations is incredibly difficult, even for very talented people. And it's often a hundred times easier to close X and start something new than try to reform X. It's the slash and burn vision informed by a large extent by technocracy. John Micklethwaite has his own recommendations. And although they're focused on reform, not quite the same degree of reinvention, it still needs to be a radical change in approach, he says. Any renewal must involve three ingredients, basic modernisation, luring talented people back into public service and focusing the state on what it does well. Simplify, cut, modernise, sell. With honest numbers, you can begin to simplify and slim Leviathan. 
The challenge now seems most similar to the one faced in the 19th century, when a new liberal order of open competition and efficiency swept away a flabbier old order of patronage and corruption. Part of the problem, it seems to me, is that Western populations are now ever more firmly in the mindset, amplified by the pandemic, that the government is the answer to most of life's problems. Getting consent for these sorts of changes would be a truly impressive feat of political persuasion, to say the least. Another part of the problem is that people think the process of experimentation with government is over and everything you need to know has been crystallised into the status quo, particularly the US Constitution. Like holy scripture, its words are poured over modern dilemmas unknown to and unanticipated by its authors have to be solved by reference to it. But as Michael Shermer notes in his book Giving the Devil His Due, Jefferson, Franklin, Payne and the others thought of social governance as a problem to be solved rather than as power to be grabbed. They thought of democracy in the same way they thought of science, as a method, not an ideology. They argued in essence that no one knows how to govern a nation, so we have to set up a system that allows for experimentation. Well, in science, you have to always be on the lookout for new evidence, new information, changing context. From the Roman Empire to the present day, societies decline when they become ossified and incapable of renewing, reforming or reinventing themselves. The author of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon, wrote that during the long, gradual period of decline, there were a number of opportunities that presented themselves where the process could have been reversed. Opportunities for reform and renewal. They always present themselves. It's down to us whether we choose to take them or not. By the way, if you're interested in what we can learn from history about the dilemmas we face in the future, this video, looking at how we've faced and responded to catastrophes in the past and what it means for the choices in front of us, you might want to have a look at that one next.